Hello, and welcome to this week's program of the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. My name is Fraheen, and I thank you all for joining us today. Each week, we connect with and hear from speakers who usually have a message focused on our love for innovation, entrepreneurship, and education. Today, I would like to introduce you all to our speaker, Deanna Persai. Deanna Persai is the Executive Director and Co-Founder of the College of Adaptive Arts. She holds a Master's in Education Policy Analysis in the School of Education from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Deanna is an active member of the Downtown Rotary Club of San Jose, and I had the pleasure of visiting her and her club last week. It was amazing. One of Deanna's bucket list items is to give a TED Talk on the subject of how knowing and enjoying an individual with a disability completes those without disabilities and makes life worth living. Today, Deanna will share her personal story of growing up with an amazing and very comedic sister who happened to have Down syndrome and how her sister became her inspiration to have Deanna and co-founder, Dr. Pamela Lindsay, found a college for adults who historically have not had access to college education. With that said, Deanna, please take it away. Hi, good morning, everybody. It's very nice. It might not be morning where you are, um, but thank you for joining. Um, I'm really very blessed. I, I, it was a delight to meet Farheen. She came and listened to my presentation at the Cupertino Rotary Club, and then she visited my club the following week, and so it's an absolute delight. So um, this really is, um, this story is a work in progress, and it's kind of my labor of love, but it certainly isn't perfect, and so I would love everyone's feedback and input afterwards on how I can make it a more impactful. Um, it is my personal story, but in many ways, it's also a very collective story of what happens to our loved ones with special needs once they exit out of the school system. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead. It's a visual presentation, so I think I'm going to um, share my screen and share my so I'm going to talk about College of Adaptive Arts through sharing my personal story of why we created the college. I do have a personal goal to give a TED Talk in my lifetime because I believe the following story contains an idea worth sharing. I would appreciate all input and feedback after the presentation of how I can continue to improve this message. So I'm Deanna Persai and I'm director and co-founder of College of Adaptive Arts which provides an equitable, lifelong collegiate experience to adults with special needs who historically haven't had access. This story is called Igniting the Spark of Abilities. I like to point out that the symbol of the mountain mover you're gonna see throughout the presentation and it's fairly impactful, meaningful to us as um, we refer to ourselves as the mountain movers and, it, and the symbol was created by one of our professors in the School of Art. There's three points of this story. Number one, what happens to individuals with special needs when their spark of abilities is ignited? Number two, there's a fairly significant age cutoff that currently exists when individuals with special needs have the opportunity to have their spark of abilities ignited. And number three, what happens to the rest of us, the general public at large, when we get to experience this electric spark. So this story begins, come on now, little PowerPoint. Oh my goodness, there we go. This story begins on October 8th, 1973, the day my baby sister Angel was born. Immediately after she was delivered, the baby was whisked out of the delivery room. After about 10 minutes, the doctor came in and gave my mom the news that the baby who had just been born would never be able to walk, talk, clothe herself, or feed herself, and it was recommended that she be put in an institution because she had Down syndrome. Now, independent of the scene, just one year prior, in 1972, an up-and-coming national reporter named Geraldo Rivera had just been given a key to the Willowbrook State School from a doctor who had just resigned in protest of the conditions within the institution. Entering the premises unannounced with a filmed crew, Mr. Rivera found such scenes as six children inhabiting one crib, children in wheelchairs lining the corridors of the institution with minimal interaction or engagement, and children and adults living alike in subhuman conditions. 
Now, very well may be that this information had not trickled down to our rural Indiana community at this time. My mom shared that she knew that the doctors had not, any had, had not had any time to do any tests on the baby. She demanded to see the baby, fearing the worst of what the condition might be. The nurses returned to my mom a warm pink bundle, and my mom said, I counted 10 fingers and 10 toes and said, thanks, but no thanks, I'm taking my baby home. So that day was the beginning of an incredible journey growing up with my baby sister, Angel, 16 months my junior. I really loved being a big sister. And certainly my baby sister did indeed learn how to sit up and she learned how to walk and she learned how to talk and to ask questions. And Angel became a rich and vibrant member of our family providing endless happy family memories, memories of love and joy. Now, I realized um, as we kept growing, I realized that being a sibling to a, big, to a sister with a special need came with a unique perspective, whereby family scenarios did not always add up the same way that perhaps typical, typical families might experience. We had a lake cottage growing up in northern Indiana where I loved to watch my sister sit out at the end of the pier and pretend that she was going fishing. She would carry out her imaginary tackle box, carefully thread her imaginary worm, and proceed to cast her fishing pole far out into the water. Then when the boats would pass by our pier, she loved to fling off her shoes and socks and wave to the boats with her feet. I remember telling one of my friends who was visiting that Angel loved to wave to, to the boats with her feet. And my friend replied, well, that's kind of weird. And I was a bit offended and I retorted, no, it's not. It's perfectly normal. She does it all the time. And then it began to sink into me that perhaps it wasn't so normal to wave two boats with your feet. And perhaps it was my world that was quite a bit different than that of typical families. As Angel continued to grow, it became quite apparent that one of her true abilities lie in the area of comedy. My mom would share that one day when Angel was a young teenager, she took her to a Bible study class on a Wednesday night at their church. At the end of, at the, end of the class, each member got to go around and say a prayer. When it got to be my sister's turn, my mom reported that she waited until the room got nice and quiet, and then she prayed very clearly and very loudly, dear Lord, please help my mom stop cussing. Angel, was, uh, Angel always knew how to read a room and figure out how to get a laugh. She certainly has a most wicked sense of wit and humor. The high school years continued to be a joyful period in her life. My mom decided to place her in the academic track in high school with typical students versus the vocational track whereby most students in special education spent their days. My mom's decision was intentional because she wanted Angel to build her social skills, her friendship base, and to be able to access elective classes such as art and choir along with her typical peers. I remember going to a high school football game where um, the cheerleaders would flock around her like she was a rock star. I affectionately referred to myself as just Angel's sister. As I look back in this period of her life, it was really one of rich and wonderful memories for both her as well as our family. Then age 22 came for Angel, which I would realize would be a significant turning point for her life as well as our families. She was able to stay for four more years after high school in a post-secondary program from ages age 18 to 22. And then at age 22, she was mandated out of the public school system. I didn't think about it too much at the time. My focus had turned to which um, college I was gonna attend, if I was gonna play sports and what I wanted to study. After high school, my mom reported that she had been set up with a job coach and that she was cleaning desks of our local high school in the summertime. 
she seemed really happy and we were really happy with the service coordinator who was working with them at the time. In my mind, I reconciled with myself, cool, this is what happens to adults with disabilities when they exit the school system. Then the next summer I came home from college and I found that Angel had gained a significant amount of weight and that she wasn't in the work program anymore. When I inquired what had happened, my mom had told me that the program had lost its funding and that there had been a change in the service coordinators and they didn't jive quite as well as with the last one. Over the years, I would come to experience that this was gonna be a regular pattern of finding a good program, being part of it for a finite time, either for it to, either for it to go away because of budget cuts or because she aged out after a fixed period. Service coordinators and care providers were in constant flux. I learned because of the nature of the job being one with such low wages, often with no medical benefits or opportunities for professional growth or development. College was not ever gonna be an option that we considered because of her intellectual disability. She reads and writes at about a third grade level. The vocational opportunities that were presented to her were primary in the, primarily in the areas of menial positions such as picking up trash, cleaning, bagging groceries, or pushing shopping carts. Angel didn't seem very interested in attending to the one day program, which was in our community. And when I went and visited with her, I distinctly remember it gave me the same pit in my stomach feeling that I got when I would enter a nursing home. The thought that this could be my existence for the rest of my life, beginning at the age of 22, left me distressed and demoralized. It was such a drastically different landscape than the opportunities that she had experienced for her first 22 years of her life. It was a pretty tumultuous time for our family, as this was the period in her life where she just kind of really seemed to be maturing and waking up to who, who she was as a person and a potential member of our, larger, of our larger community. And it was the exact same time that most of her support services abruptly ended. Being almost like a twin to such a unique and engaging sibling, I often thought of what, what life would have been life of, like if our roles had been swapped. If I had been the one with Down syndrome and she had been the typical one going off to college and having a family. This notion was driven home last week when I watched one of our students get off the bus when I, when I was driving and I watched all the passengers in front of her take off down the street about 20 feet ahead. Really got me thinking as to what the world must look like through the eyes of an adult with a special need. It might very well be that a good portion of your life is looking at people's backsides when you're out in the community, when you don't navigate at the same pace as the general public. It might seem like a big blur when everyone is so into their lives and devices and quickly whizzing past you, not even realizing that you're even there. I know that each day there are hard quizzical expressions of surprise, shock, pity, and perhaps a hint of revulsion. It can be a very fleeting look, and it's often followed by averted eyes. There are phrases of you can't, and don't, and no, heard throughout the day when you're navigating in a world that's really not set up for you. And there also might be a fair amount of existential time when you're waiting for transport or waiting for someone to show up or waiting for the next direction to be given, you might think that so much of the world is just out of your control and you don't know exactly how to jump in or show the world what you might have to offer. So with this knowledge and background in hand, my colleague and I founded an adaptive collegiate environment in 2009 for adults who are interested in continuing their education, but for which an accredited associate's degree in a community college campus would not be a feasible option for a myriad of reasons. In this collegiate environment, students don't have to be able to read or write to enroll. There are no tests, there are no papers, there's no homework. 
We invite students to only sign up for the classes that they have an interest in. It is an authentic co collegiate environment where they earn credits and diplomas, but the diplomas are privately accredited non-transferable diplomas, but diplomas nonetheless, just like they see their peers, siblings, and cousins striving to achieve in the world. In this collegiate space, we have 10 distinct schools of instruction. Within the School of Library Arts, we instill the love of reading. Within our School of Dance, we give opportunities to adults to become dancers and choreographers. Within the School of Business, we cultivate entrepreneurs. The School of Music fosters the love of music and instruments. In the School of Television and Film, students learn to become on-camera actors as well as camera and lighting operators. Our School of Theater celebrates stage performers and thespians. Within our School of Fine Arts, students learn to become fine artists exploring various artistic mediums. Our School of Communications inspires orators and public speakers. Within our School of Health and Wellness, we have a cheer squad, a robust weekly walking team, and a golf team. And the School of Science and Technology allows students to explore scientific concepts and learn about the latest technological advances. In addition to our 10 schools of study, our college gets students out in the community as public speakers. There's a robust and rapidly growing learning, learning, distance learning component whereby students who have moved away or who do not have regular access to transportation can zoom and beam in real time to class. We have a parent support component whereby parents of our students regularly connect and learn and share strategies and resources. And we get our students out in the community performing multiple times a month with over 10 distinct touring troops. A unique layer of this college that has evolved over time is that over half of our professors and staff are also individuals with differing abilities. These are staff members with hidden differences, such as being cancer survivors, having autism and dyslexia, and staff members with visible differences, such as cerebral palsy, being wheelchair users or having visual impairments. Many of our staff haven't had wonderful success in traditional workforce environments, but here they are, the, are our frontline professors, leaders, and mentors to our ever-growing student body. One young man, our current director of School of Music, holds a degree from Berkeley. He is a professional musician that was on the music circuit for 10 years. He happens to have been blinded at four months of age in a car accident sitting on his mother's lap. He has struggled securing traditional jobs in a typical workforce environment. At our college, he is a true leader and professor sharing his trade and abilities with the students. We've gotten some good traction with the message messaging when we explain that this, this model of education is similar to the athletic model of Special Olympics. If you're not familiar with the Special Olympics model, Special Olympics allows individuals of any age and ability to look forward to a new sport to participate in each season for as long as they would like to participate. And many times we're asked the question, what are you training them at, to do at your college? This is certainly a valid and logical question when, when you're thinking through the lens of skill-based vocational training and for traditional vocational opportunities. 
However, this collegiate model readjusts the lens from vocational training to a focus on lifelong education. So just like you wouldn't ask a Special Olympian basketball player which NBA team they're aspiring to try out for, this collegiate model focuses on education and lifelong learning, allowing adults with special needs to have their authentic abilities ignited, giving them the opportunity to become the best versions of themselves which I believe is a basic human notion that we all share. The mindset of this co co collegiate environment is that instead of giving adults with a, with a special need a broom or a rag, we give our students a paintbrush and a microphone and a new and expanded set of tools which can facilitate a spark of their authentic abilities. So now's the one time I might need you to turn your microphones back on because this is a little bit of a social experiment, um, audience participation. Um, I'm a pretty good dancer. I've danced my whole life um, and I've taken many classes. So I've decided that I'm going to compose a one minute piece of original choreography and I'm going to put myself on social media. Um, I'm going to hire a professional choreographer to coach me for three hours a day for six weeks and I'm going to buy a new red flapper dress to wear and I'm going to videotape myself and put myself up on social media for one minute. How many views and likes do you believe that I could get? Mr. Shags, how many would you give me? Oh, 100,000. Cool, that's amazing. Wow. That's, wow, okay. How about Vandana? Not sure, because uh, you can get millions. People become famous by, you know, constantly being on the social website. So it all depends on... Do I look like I can get millions? Really? You would you you if if you viewed me dancing, you would you would like share and think I'm a viral sensation dancer? It could be see Ganjam style. There was a Korean who actually became famous through the social media and he got much eyeballs. So it will all depend on the whole composition and whom you attract, whose attention you attract, basically. I love it. Okay, well. Watch this. This is just this with one of our students. Check it out. Let's see if it's going to work. And then I hit enter. Yeah. I love the dress. The flapper is great. Right. Oh, look at that excitement. Because her dad, he doesn't get to come to too much because he's working a lot. And mom. <laughs> so, so far, Miss Natalie so far has had 44,000 views <laughs> nice. so far. And I have to believe that I don't think I would probably get 44,000 doing the, the same piece of choreography. And to me, this was really um, a thunderbolt revelation, quite truthfully, that when given the, under the, given the right circumstances and structure, students and adults with special needs possess the ability to connect with people in ways that us typical folks would never be able to hold a candle to. And it made me realize that I think that we're missing a boat, missing the boat as a society when we exclusively try to fit adults with special needs 
into existing traditional vocational opportunities when in so many cases their true abilities lie in becoming contributors to the economies of joy and fulfillment. So feedback that we've gotten from about the college over the years as we perform multiple times a month all throughout the community at cancer walks and at holiday ballet performances at senior centers and at disability awareness days and at local dance festivals with the focus on celebrating abilities and transforming perception from members of the public at large who see the students perform each and every time we hear comments such as I didn't know they could do that and I feel so alive when I watch them perform which I think is one of the true reasons why our students video has gone gone viral. One of our parents report that CAA now means a future for his family and a viable path that allows his adult child to thrive and flourish and to reach his true potential. So how could you help us move this mountain? The next time that you see an adult with a special need, you can look them in the eye and you can smile and you can think about the abilities that might lie just below the surface that are yearning, that they're yearning to share. You could come and take a tour each Friday that school is in session of this innovative collegiate environment. You can help us think of new community venues to give the students opportunities to perform and connect and to transform perception in the community. And you can think about ways we can transition this innovative collegiate model to a permanent location so that our adults with special needs can have access to a sustainable and replicable infrastructure for lifelong learning in an equitable collegiate environment. So, so far I've shared two of the three points of my story. Number one, spectacular results can happen for individuals with special needs when they have the opportunity to have their spark of abilities ignited. Number two, there's a fairly dramatic and drastic age cutoff when individuals with special needs have the opportunity to have their authentic abilities ignited. Services and programs are expansive and robust for children with special needs. But at age 22, the landscape becomes significantly different and smaller. It feels like the old institutional mindset still widely prevails with the types of opportunities available for adults over age 22. College of Adaptive Arts is a part of a, of a new wave and innovate, of innovative models engaging adults with differing abilities, maintaining the highest of expectations, listening to their requests and desires, and never giving up on the students to reach their full potential. Now I'm gonna end the presentation with sharing my third point, what happens to the rest of us, the general public at large, when we experience the incredible spark of abilities. I share a text that my sister sent to me last week, which in it, she said she was missing me about 555%. Her passion and her drive are so real and palpable, I just cannot make this up. So that seems like a pretty accurate number when thinking about how us typical folks can get creative, think differently, and structure opportunities that ignite the abilities of adults with special needs. This includes ideas such as creating a podcasting class whereby adults like my sister have the opportunity to learn to interview and be interviewed. And in turn, what comes back to me into the general public 
who get to connect with the students in, an, in, a, in this innovative way in the forms of joy, fulfillment, and a profound feeling of life worth living, I believe pretty accurately equates to a rate of roughly 555%. And this is my idea worth sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Wow. Thank you, Dana. Thank you so much for your presentation. I will never get tired of hearing your story. Um, before I go into the question and answer period, I wanted to quickly introduce the other members on the call. So when I say your name, please wave. Um, so I see, first off, I have um, Vandana Agarwal, and she is based in New Delhi, India. Just kind of wave. Hi, Vandana. Um, and then I have um, Sandy, who is in Fremont, California. Um, and then Shags, who I think you are up in, where are you? Uh, you're in Walnut Creek, right? Yes. Perfect. Oh. Walnut Creek. Very nice. Cool. Thank you all again so much for joining us. Um, and so I would like to begin our question and answer period. Um, so I believe Vandana, you have raised your hand. So please, I will start with you, Vandana. Go ahead and you can unmute your mic. Vandana, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Donna, for a good presentation and the, more than the presentation, the real work you are doing uh, <laughs> for special uh, children with special needs. And it strikes a chord with me because one of my nephew is uh, a special child. So that was the very reason I wanted to actually, I had marked this, uh, uh, this speaker series in my diary that I would be definitely attending. Mm. And it's, I'm glad to have met you online. So I, I would uh, like to know, my, my nephew lives in UK. So you also mentioned about online training. So how can he you know, get to learn some things from your school? So it would be a, a, just a matter of connecting with our IT director. His name is Michael Riesman, and we have the ability to Zoom or, um, or through a, something, it's called a Beam Robot through suitable technologies where your nephew could actually um, control the robot and move around the class um, through the robot. So I can just send an email and connect you up. Now the, all of the learning happens real time. So we don't really record the, the, the classes and have them available after, afterwards because most of the rich instruction happens during that one hour period of time. So it would be a time differential thing. We'd have to see if it would work between the UK and um, San Jose uh, right now, but absolutely that is that is a very easy way for him to get plugged into a community through the computer. See, I really don't know whether he has Down syndrome or he has some other you know, disability because uh, his parents are uh, doctors, so I can put uh, you in touch with the parents of the child and then you can have a discussion as to what are his disabilities and what is the special condition. He has some genetic makeup, and because so of which is a rare condition. And his di so, so now the issue is like, say, he could not play a piano because he would, didn't have the sense that what is a little finger, what is a middle finger, and all that. What is my thumb? So yeah. in UK, the teachers are very good. They had to physically, you know, make him understand and now he can at least uh, read, uh, see the book and he can play the piano and right. he does many activities and he reads correctly, he rather corrects the spelling, but the issue is that he doesn't have the comprehension. Like if he reads something, he won't be able to comprehend and then he watches some Mr. Uh, you know, uh, I'm forgetting. Some cartoon he watches, which he, he watches only that. That cartoon has, you know, many series for different uh, levels, but he, he simply may cannot comprehend or he cannot do so. Basically, with after talking to the parent, 
and maybe connecting with his school teachers you will be able to find out as to what what you could the focus area would be him absolutely i would be honored thank you vijani yeah we can like i try to spend time with him and socialize with him so just because i i think that he should get a sense that there is somebody for him absolutely thank you for doing that they're very joyful they really are and they desperately want to connect and to figure out how to be a part of the community absolutely great um shai see i try to make him uh, like you know I, i i think he's my favorite uh, <laughs> like nephew out of all so anyway thank you very so, much so now uh, want to take more time and one more question i had is that when these children come to your notice do you educate the parents that uh, this uh, you know this genetic stuff can pass on to the next three two three generations so no, during you know medical, no we don't have a medical during pregnancy, during pregnancy there is a test where the the person can get to know whether the child will be having such uh, genetic makeup or not yeah. so rather people who have such people in the family tree should be advised to take a med- the test certainly yeah absolutely thank you vendana i got a new question at least farin will know that <laughs> i am not from the medical field okay sure. now i hang up <laughs> thank you great um yeah in the in the uh, interest of time since we're already kind of at 40 minutes so i want to um give the other participants a chance to ask a question shag sandy would you do you have any questions not so much a question just a comment i really commend you on this that mm-hmm. an excellent program uh, I, i've been involved in special needs with a cousin a first cousin who came out with the umbilical cord around his neck and for for a couple of years they weren't sure how that impacted him and it, it he's never really progressed beyond a fourth grade level uh, educationally and developmentally also had some speech issues with it and he was in Mansfield Ohio they had some excellent programs he even went through special olympics and uh, my my home my original rotary club always had a program for at christmas time we would put on a program uh, a holiday party for the special needs adults and started out with children and over like 20 years with that club we all grew up together so yeah. wonderful seeing everybody again and and, and participating and I'm, i'm just going to post something in the chat room and this is a this is an organization started by Leonard Kurtz who is a friend of our family that created a school and a workshop for children and adults with developmental disabilities cool that's awesome Ohio. and uh, i looked at their day program while you were talking and many of the things that they do are very similar with gardening and sewing and creative writing and yoga music visual art and dance that's awesome that's beautiful thanks so wonderful what you're doing thank you you're welcome and sandy do you have a have a comment or question you're muted okay um, yes okay um I, my question is is where is your school physically and how many students do you have yeah our school right now is at parkmoor and race um on the north side of the street across from the sobrado building so we're in the same building as as children's musical theater um our building has now been sold so we are on the lookout for new space and we don't know where we're going but we probably have 8 to 12 months um we have 114 students now we're 10 years old when we started in 2009 we had 12 so uh we've grown 1075% so we're growing in the right direction um but it is a very scary time in the bay, bay area um because we can't afford um rent or to buy a place right now um so we're really working with the community colleges to see if we can transition on to a community college campus to be that next layer down for adults that want to continue to learn um but for which their an an uh, accredited associate street degree is going to be out of reach but um we're trying to align with the community college great work thank you perfect so um seeing as there are no more questions or comments rotary members and guests please make sure you fill out the attendance section and leave us a comment thank you again diana and i will turn it back to you for your final words
Um, thank you for your astute questions. Um, I really appreciate it. If you have any more um, advice or feedback, I'm trying to craft this story that it's a personal story, but it's, it's also um, a very collective story. And um, I'm trying to help the general world, the general public at large to enter our, our world, um, navigating uh, within the world of special needs and to show that even though it can kind of scary and daunting, it's actually a tremendously joyful and gratifying experience when you kind of recalibrate and just go to their level and enjoy their authentic abilities. Um, it's 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 an amazing and incredible experience and um that's the story i'm hoping to get out to the world <laughs>